this topic we are discussing. And it started happiness by looking at the magnitude of distress. So Arjuna is in great distress. See, generally, we don't realize the value of something <coughs> till it is lost. Most of us, how many, of the, how many times do we think about digestion? Maybe the only time we think about digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, are we, we may or may not really be experiencing much happiness, but when we experience the complete lack of happiness, the complete opposite of happiness, that is distress, we can't deny that. It's very slow, but it's okay. It's coming. So here, Arjuna is experiencing an extremely difficult situation. And the situation is, we won't get into specifics, he has to fight against his own relatives. It's not more easy for him to do that. Some people say that, oh, happiness and distress, they're just a state of mind. Then you are happy, you'll be happy. Well, just go and slap that person. <laughs> <laughs> no, or make them sit on a bed of thorns. And it happens in such a long time. Hello, my cheek is stinging. Hello, my thighs and the bottom is. It appears with blood. It's not a state of being alone. Not a state of mind alone. Actually, there is a reality in the outer world. And in the outer world, there are times when things are stressful. So we can't just deny that. Arjuna is in a situation where he's in great distress. The Gita explains our existence is at three broad levels. There's the soul, the mind, and the body. There is Ugra Karma and there is Tugra Karma. <laughs> Tugra Karma is Ugra Karma is bad actions which is great trouble for us. Tugra Karma is Technology related barriers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, seems like we are going through the Tugra Karma right now. <laughs> when we are going through the phase of Atta Karma, all that we can do is calm, snatch, so hard. All right. So, just pray for a few minutes. So, basically, the idea that happiness is simply a state of mind, that is an exaggerated truth. There is truth to it. There can be an external problem and somebody can make the problem huge. One of my friends in Canada is a, is a lawyer. He practices family law. The family law basically means it's mostly about divorces. <laughs> <laughs> And generally, when I talk about the rest, you know, people are not so interested in moral things, but they're interested in factual things. So I talk about social, social breakdown in the rest, how marriages are falling apart, how addiction is increasing, how things are coming. So that's better. So you can explain this before I go there, but the visual is always more attractive than the verbal. <laughs> so that talks that about three levels of being social, spiritual, and the soul, mind, and then and B is the body of physical. The three levels of being. And all three affect us. At all three levels, we are affected. So if at the physical level, at the level of the body there's a problem, it affects us. If there's if pain because the hand is fractured, do not say this is a state of mind. No, it's a state of bone and a state of bone misalignment. <laughs> so we will talk about what role the mind plays. The idea over here is that we could separate these three into distinct states of being. The soul is here, the mind is here, now the body is here. Now at the level of the body, there can be happiness and there can be distress. But along with that, what can happen is now the souls, soul primarily experiences life through the mind. That means the soul's consciousness comes through the mind and it goes to the outer world through it. That's why we say somebody is absent-minded. We are talking with them and their eyes are blazing. 
Come to earth, come to earth. <laughs> so absent minded means what has happened is that if you consider the soul is here, the body is here, but the mind is somewhere else. So they are here, we are talking with them. Their body is there, but they are not there only. The consciousness is going here somewhere. And there is no consciousness over here. This is when you talk with someone, oh, I'm sorry, this is the one, what is it? So that's why the mind, so the mind is, in a sense, the link between the soul and the body. Now, it is meant to function as a link, but it sometimes functions as much more than a link. So we talk about this in terms of happiness and distress primarily. So what happens is, at the level, at the level of the body, there can be happiness and distress. Physically painful, physically pleasant situations can be there. But beyond that, the soul is here, the mind is here. Now, let's put it at the physical level, there can be body. At the level, at this level, there can be a small distress. But the mind, by the time it can reach the mind, it can become a huge distress. The mind can make a small problem very big. I was talking about this friend in Canada. So, he, so I often, as I was talking about sociology, that I often talk of how in the, in the Western and Westernized part of the world, marriages are breaking apart, families are not staying together. So divorces are increasing. So when I went to Canada and New Zealand, both places they always told me that, that the organizers of the world don't, don't tell this. Is it, is it because people will be affronted? The, the, the divorce is not a pleasant thing, it's heartbreaking at times. Is it like the thing because the mind does have trauma? So no, it's not traumatic, it's not true. Okay, that's what it happens. That means people are marriages are stabilizing, divorce are decreasing. So, no. Devotions are not decreasing, marriages are decreasing. <laughs> <laughs> People are not getting married only. So there are no marriages, the marriage divorces will decrease. But when people do get married, they also separate. So there was this uh, couple who came, they said, what has happened is in the West, individual autonomy has been emphasized much more than beauty. Autonomy means I am who I am, I could do what I want to do. But duty means we belong to a broader whole. And we, we are expected to do certain things as a part of the whole. So if I'm part of a family, I have certain duties to a family. If I'm part of a community, I have certain duties to a community. If I'm part of a country, I have certain duties to a country. Ultimately, I'm part of God, I have certain duties to God. So there are these two aspects to every individual. Consider individual, <laughs> there is autonomy. This is what I want to do. And there is duty. Duty is what is expected of us. So ideally, both of them should be balanced. So now in the West, autonomy is emphasized very much. And because there's emphasis on autonomy, for example, they have the idea that uh, if a couple can't stay together, then there is something called no fault divorce. No fault means nobody fault, we just don't get along with each other. So actually, a 30-year-old marriage can be dissolved more easily than a $30 phone contract. Hmm. You know, if you pay $30 to get a, get a phone contract data for one month or two months, you can't dissolve that. So it's become much easier, it's tragic. So it, a couple came then you don't want to divorce. This is why. He says that you know, the, the husband and the wife, they cannot agree what temperature to keep for the air conditioner in their home? <laughs> <laughs> the husband wants a higher temperature, the wife wants lower temperature. Now, is that a reason to divorce? If most people don't even have air conditioner in their home. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay, there's some discomfort, but there's a higher duty in work. So the point I'm making over here is that there are situation in the world where the mind, if we go back over here, the mind can make a small distress very big. It's a problem. Maybe one of them, one of them has to get more warm clothes than other at the time of home. Whatever they may have to make some adjustments. But if we have the idea life is meant for me to do what I want to do, 
And anything that comes in the way, look at us. So the small problem can become huge. So the mind can similarly not just exaggerate problems, it can also exaggerate pleasures. There is some happiness, some joy, some pleasure. It's a timely pleasure, but the mind can exaggerate it. It can make us feel, oh, this pleasure, if I don't get it, I won't be able to live. So this is where sometimes a person is hooked to alcohol. So, I'll die if I don't drink. And it's more likely you will die if you drink. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how the mind exaggerates the pleasure. So, is happiness a state of mind? Yes, it is definitely a state of mind. Is it only a state of the mind? No. There is a state of physical being also, which can be pleasant or unpleasant. But beyond that, how our mind sees it can make small pleasures big or small problems also big. So, taking this forward. But now, why are we discussing this? We're discussing how the Gita addresses Arjuna's concern about he's in great distress. And Krishna tells Arjuna in this verse that those who are well situated in this too, they are characterized by one thing. See, Tushta, how are they happy? There is the outer source of happiness and there is inner source of happiness. And Krishna says, turn away from outer source and turn towards inner source of happiness. Prajahati yada kaman sarvan partha manogatan atmanye vatmana dushtahan nita pragyasta So, uh, the idea is, in the outer situation right now, he has to fight a war. And that's painful. Because he has his relatives, his venerable elders on the other side. But expect that outer situation suddenly become harmonious and joyful is not good. Not is not a realistic expectation. So Krishna says, turn inward. So if you consider an individual to be here, so you can either look for outer happiness or you can look for inner happiness. The Gita is telling us, turn this way. From outward to inward. And in this way, one can find real happiness. Now, first of all, when we say outer or inner happiness, what do we mean by that? Because even if it is spiritual happiness, inner happiness. But spiritual happiness also, we get now if you want to love spiritual, we come outside to a particular place. Isn't it? We are doing outer activities. We may we are participating in kirtans, we are singing, we are sometimes dancing, we are taking food. So, how exactly is this inner happiness when we are involved in the outer activities are involved. So when we say outer and inner, we can't artificially fight it. We are, we are composite beings at this stage. Our existence is phys spiritual, phys mental, physical, all three are there. So even when you're experiencing outer happiness, say when somebody is going to a movie and watching a movie or somebody is going to maybe a sauna or somewhere just to have uh, pleasant sensations, they're there, the physical is involved, but the mental is also involved. If somebody has been insulted and then they go to a, uh, go to a feast, they're meeting gulab jamun, but in their mind they're tasting karela. <laughs> <laughs> they're tasting bitter gold. Because their mind is replaying the insult that they're with. So, even when there's outer happiness, it does not, does not mean that there's no inner component. Happiness cannot be experienced without any inner component. So we are talking about happiness, outer and inner. It refers not to the activity, but it refers to the destination. Destination. What is it that we are trying to achieve by that? So this classification of outer and inner is based on what is it we are trying to achieve? So, when we are seeking inner happiness, now we have come to satsang, we are hearing some satsang, and we will take a book and read it. After you go back, you read the Bhagavad Gita. So, we are doing outer activities. 
But our destination is there. We have to understand our soul. We have to understand the ultimate reality, Krishna. We have to connect more with Him. So the activities are for any kind of happiness, for pursuing it, there are two certain activities. In that sense, there is an outer component. But what is the destination? So outer and inner happiness are determined not so much by the activity, but by the purpose. What is it that we are trying to ultimately connect with? What is it that we are trying to ultimately do? <laughs> so having said this, well, what is the <clears throat> problem with outer happiness? There are so many sources of happiness in the world. You know, we can just click on our phones and go to YouTube. There's so much entertainment. Okay, there's so many video games. So many things are there. There's so much enjoyment coming there. So yes, it is enjoyment. But Krishna later talks about the nature of this enjoyment. He says, the most material enjoyment, they are like nectar in the beginning, but poison in the end. Yes, the, a great amritopam parinami krishna. It will be like nectar in the beginning. It's irresistible, intoxicating nectar. But afterwards, it becomes like poison. Now, addiction is a tragic example of this. It's when a person becomes, nobody is, tries to become an addict. Nobody is born an addict. He's honest, somebody falls out of the mother's womb, the cigarette in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> And when they, when they suppose somebody are smoking, and they are smoking, now if they know it, they don't think I'm a smoker. Mm-hmm. I'm just being cool. We're not being cool, we are being a fool. <laughs> Isn't it? So what is happening is that it tastes like nectar. It tastes. I feel like you are even feeling smoking. You can't smoke, it doesn't feel good. But just you feel like you're hanging out with a cool crowd, so you feel good. And then once you get spoke to it, then there's an initial nectar that is there. But after that nectar, the poison comes, the addiction comes. If somebody takes alcohol, starts doing drugs, then initially, yes, there is a high, there's an intoxication. But afterwards, there is cost, there's a financial cost, there's a physical cost, a health cost, down, there's a social cost. We cannot behave properly when we are intoxicated. There can be professional cost. We lose our jobs and when somebody gets addicted, they get a traditional addiction, right? They can't get a job afterwards. Say somebody is doing drugs or caught doing drugs, there can be relational costs. People may lose their relationship. And we don't even talk about spiritual costs over it. So this the tale of poison can be very long. So Krishna says, therefore, Prajahati Tita Kama. He says, turn away. It's interesting what Krishna is telling away again is not. Turn away from worldly objects. He's saying, turn away from worldly desires. Turning away from objects is not alone enough. We have to turn away from those desires. Sarvan Partha Manogatha. Let's try to understand what he's saying over here. If you consider this the soul, the mind, and the body. And then here there is a physical world. So, Krishna is saying that the desires for enjoying the world, they come from the mind. Manogata. They come from the mind and then they captivate us. Normally we think, oh, I see something, we are just passing by some road and we see a hotel, there is some nice menu seems to be there. Okay, I want to go and eat it. So we think that I see an external object and then the desire comes. Well, that is true to some level. But generally, if there had been no past impression of that, we didn't even know what a vertical item is, then we wouldn't even have the desire to eat it. Does anyone know what is a baklava? Baklava? I didn't know it. Okay. Don't be a sport. <laughs> so when I went to Australia for the first time, the reward is, uh, was, in, said, you know, we have a desert, we have a baklava. <laughs> we like to have it. Now, you know, baklava, the name of the song is. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, maybe later. I don't want to be polite and say no. So then, 
I hadn't heard about it. I saw it also, okay, it was just like India, that's sweet. I said, no. So if you don't even know about something, the desire will not come at all. But generally, our desires come in, especially strong desires. Strong desires come not just by seeing some desirable object. Strong desires come when we have some past memories of engaging or indulging in that object. So, Prachahati Rakaman Sarvan Path Manohar. So, what Krishna is telling over here is that if we, if we want to find happiness, if you separate these two, mind and then body, and it's a part of the the part of the physical world. So, what he's saying here is, here there might be some sense object, something which looks very tempting. So, Krishna is not just saying, say no to this. Krishna is saying here, let's put this as a it's worldly object, and here there is a worldly desire. Certainly. So Krishna is saying, say no to this over there. Not just say no to the objects out there. Sometimes we focus too much on saying no to the objects, we may develop aversion. And we may look down, we may condemn, we may become judgmental. Mm -hmm. The point is say no to the desires. That seems to be very difficult. Saying no to the objects is maybe it's possible, but saying no to desires. That, uh, it's like, I'm a past, but you know, I'm saying no to the objects, only by then, you know, and you've been fasting, but mind is food, 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 So, you know, something like that is going on in the mind. But it seems to be more to that itself. Why? Because if you're only saying no to the objects without saying no to desires, we were simply tormenting ourselves. Hmm? As the desires are there. Now, I'll talk a little bit about how we have to manage desires. But at this point, if we are focusing only on saying, oh, I'm going to do this. But inside the desire is there, and we are entertaining the desire. We don't say no to the desire. Then we will feel really tormented. Why can't I? No, I shouldn't have it. No, person. Why is not good? Means it feels good. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with a little of it? So many questions will keep coming. So it's internally, it's important to start saying no desires. It will take time. But if we understand that this initial nature that is there is followed by this long poison, then that is what will enable us to say no to the desire itself. So I'll explain this a little bit more. But before I go there, this Krishna talks about another kind of happiness. This is 1838. And this was before that. In 1837, he talks about another kind of happiness. That is, poison in the beginning, nectar in the end. That which tastes like poison in the beginning, but which tastes like nectar in the end. Say, suppose somebody is physically not very fit, maybe they had a fracture or something like that. Now, for them to recover, they start exercising. Exercising can be painful. But when they exercise, it's poison that they are going through. However, they keep exercising, they recover mobility, they recover health, they regain functionality, and their life's quality is so much better. So the nectar will come later. When a child wants to start studying, a child is told to start studying. For a child, okay, why study? I just want to play with my toys. So it's focusing on this letter like this, this letter like that, and this letter is written like this, this letter will sound like this. It's also complex, but it's possible. However, once we learn to communicate, once we become gain literacy, a whole universe opens for us. Generally accessible. So I'm not giving a spiritual example over here. Even in ordinary life, there are many things which, which are good for us, which taste like poison in the beginning, but they will taste like it in the end. So Krishna is saying, turn away from this and turn toward this. So Prachahati Yata Kama Sarvan Vatam Nogatan. 
आ पुण्य एवात्मना दुष्ट एंड फाइंड हैप्पीनेस विद इन एंड एक्सप्लेन व्हाट इट मींस बट लेट्स लुक एट दिस ट्रांजिशन अ लिटिल बिट मोर अब अर्लियर आई टॉक अबाउट अबाउट थ्री लेवल्स ऑफ बीइंग द सोल द माइंड एंड द बॉडी लेट्स कॉम्प्लिकेट दिस अ लिटिल बिट मोर बाय कॉम्प्लिकेटेड बिकॉज complicating simple things is the way of growing in understanding but if you only complicate and limit over there then you don't grow much in understanding it's like you know first thing this is black this is white that's all there is oh but there's so many shades of gray that's very complex yeah but also you have some shades of gray yeah actually this purple looks quite different from orange and so many colors so generally how education grows this first we learn something simple Then we will find it's complex, not as simple as that. Then after that, it's actually not as complex as that. It's simple. So, so education involves two parts: complexifying the simple and simplifying the complex. So, if somebody does only the first one part or two parts, then it's not really educated. So, like here, it's black and white. Here, there is shades of gray, and there, there is. is a spectrum of colors so that's how we grow in education sometimes it's, it's only something is very very simple without actually uh, revealing the nuances it's only kept at this stage it will become bored it will become repetitive but it's only kept at this stage it will become exhausting you can't understand anything only I don't know what to do. This is also confusing. This is where it becomes illuminating. Darling, what I'm learning it it gels with my real life experience. Yeah, I can see there's many shades of gray, and now I'm feeling transcending all this. So now, well, so what I said is that I I'll make it a little more complicated. The, in the interface between the soul. And the body, the subtle body. We could say there are two components to it. There is the intelligence, and there is the mind. So the mind is like the term "shop." Sometimes the word "mind" is used as shorthand to refer to the entire subtle body. But sometimes the word "mind" is also used to refer to one particular component within the subtle body. So, like if you consider Delhi. Is a union territory, but within Delhi as a union territory, there is also Delhi as a city. So we need to know what we are referring to. Somebody in the Delhi union territory says, "I am going to Delhi," and somebody is from outside says, "You are already in Delhi." <laughs> so what are you referring to? So we are talking about here the mind and intelligence are two components of the subtle world. The mind is generally impulsive. The intelligence is more reflective. It thinks it analyzes. It impulsive means just do it. Come on, enjoy. Just act immediately. Whereas reflective think, be careful. So, the Krishna first part of this verse, which is Hati Ra Kaman Sarvan Parthamanogata, he says, don't get carried away by the mind. The second part he says is strengthen the intelligence. So now, if you forget everything, see if you can remember this diagram. I hope I can draw this with sufficient complexity <laughs> <laughs> because it's a complicated concept. So the soul is here. Now, around the soul, there is the intelligence and there is the mind. and we could say this whole thing is the self now here there is what you can call as a higher happiness higher happiness is poison in the beginning nectar in the end and here there is lower here there is Lower happiness, nectar in the beginning, poison in the end. Lower happiness means 
it is it is like a low lying fruit if you want some fruit you just raise your hand and pluck the fruit it's easier some fruits are higher that you know climb it it's lower means it's very easily available but it also takes us down the road it, it puts us in misery so now with this understanding what krishna is telling is that the mind chasing the soul Is visible or not functional? Visible? No. Yes. So they are jarring the other one. Yes. 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 And on the other hand, we need intelligence to look at this pleasure. So now, normally we think of the conflict, the tug of war being over here. We think of the tug of war as over here. So. Should I wake up in the morning and do some meditation, do some study, do some exercise? Should I just feel comfortable? So that's an external choice. Really. We feel the tug of war is over here, but actually Krishna is saying the tug of war is over here. That who are we going to listen to? Is the soul going to listen to the intelligence or to the mind? <laughs> so if we are only fighting the external tug of war, I'm not in this. I will not do this. You know, I will not eat uh, fatty foods. I eat only healthy foods. You know, I will not waste time on social media. I only study the syllabus. Okay, they do those activities, and that's good. But if internally we are not strengthening our intelligence, and if we are not strengthening the intelligence, and we are not weakening the mind, then we will feel tormented. We will we will not be able to sustain for very long. We can tolerate pain to some extent, but we can't keep tolerating pain constantly. Yeah, everyone has a threshold for pain. Some people may have higher thresholds, some people may have lower thresholds. But so when do we have inner torment? When external choice is opposed to the internal choice. That means externally. I am choosing higher happiness, but internally I am listening to the mind. The mind is saying, "Oh, this food is so enjoyable. I am not going to eat it." Okay, we sometimes have a discipline; we have to do it. But if you want to sustain it, we need to be able to weaken the mind, we need to silence the mind, or at least turn away from the mind towards the intentions. You okay, are not eating it. Why? I am not a I am not simply torn. I am making myself suffer. The higher purpose over here. We focus on the higher purpose. Yeah. I want to be healthy. I want to be around this. I want whatever we. What is our purpose? That purpose we need to focus. And going back to this diagram now, as I said, the mind looks generally at initial things. So the mind sees the initial nectar and says, "I want this." The mind sees the initial poison and says, "I don't want it." So we could put it. Let's see if I can find another color. Hmm. See this box. So the mind sees here. Nice. The mind sees initial things, and this it says yes. And this it says no. Whereas the intelligence is able to see beyond the initial. See it here. So the intelligence sees this. Are there nectar over here? Let's do this. And he says, "This is poison over there. Let's not." <laughs> so what happens is, if we want to sustain ourselves in the things that we know will make us happy, we don't need a big discourse revealing some mystery about how we'll become happy. Yeah, there are some some, some things. Which we may not know about at all. That can bring us happiness. So some of us may not know about spirituality. Some of us may not know about bhakti. Some of us may not know about Krishna. 
But even among the things that we know, we all often do things which we know are going to get us in trouble later. We often avoid the things which we ourselves know are good for us. So why is that? Because the mind is weak. Sorry, is the mind weak? Yeah, the mind is not weak. The mind makes us weak. <laughs> the mind first makes us weak and then it makes us weak. <laughs> it makes us weak when we end up in distress. But so, the, the change has to happen not only in terms of the outrights. I won't do this, how I will do this. It has to happen in terms of the inner power dynamics being shifted. The inner power dynamics means, see, when we are attached, this, is, is this clear? It's color over all clear. So when we are attached, what happens is, the mind is much stronger than the intelligence. When we are detached, that's the intelligence is stronger than the mind. So for us, if we want to be happy, Krishna says, we need to sit up and There is a higher happiness of the Atman Neva Tunatushita. That I connect with the higher things in life, the more meaningful things in life. I will find happiness. So I need to persist in that. If you do persist in this way, we will find higher happiness. So broadly, there are two kinds of people in the world. Some people are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so the wise listen to their intelligence. The otherwise listen to their mind. Now again, we will talk a little bit about later. The mind is not all bad. We don't have to demonize the mind. The mind is like a child. Now, the child is just impulsive. The child is looks for real things. The child is not to play, doesn't want to go to school, doesn't want to eat healthy food, there's only tasty food. So the child needs to be disciplined. The child needs to be able to grow. So we don't have to treat the mind like an enemy. We want to help the mind also to grow. You want the mind to eventually see the intelligence perspective and accept that this is true, this is good for you. But till that happens, the mind may have to push them. Sometimes say the mother, the child says, No, I don't want to take the injection. The mother says, No, you have to take it. No, I don't want to take it. The mother may have to neglect the child and the injection the child. I guess sometimes you want to, you may have to neglect her mind. That doesn't mean we repress or suppress our mind. It means eventually you want to help your mind to change those. But initially, when the mind is filled with all these worldly desires, which take us away from our life's higher purpose, then we need to be able to say no to the mind. So, for us, I'll conclude with two points now. That we can have two questions. The key question, if you want to go from here to here, is that you want to strengthen the intelligence and you want to weaken the mind. So, how do we do this? So generally speaking, weakening the mind is extremely difficult. It will take a long time. What is much easier is to strengthen the intelligence. Because it's like, say, if we can take this matter to understand this, the mind and the intelligence. So the mind is like a child. And the intelligence is like the mother, or it is like a parent. <clears throat> In the West, when they say, they say, we don't use, why mother? She will panic. She said, like, she will take care of everyone. Everyone should take care. And the mother will come before they take care. <laughs> you know, sometimes, nowadays, they use the word. Uh, I was with my, I gone to a friend. Uh, another friend, he was, uh, yeah, he's a friend and a devotee. He's becoming a devotee. So he says, he's so happy. He says, we are pregnant. You think your wife is like, no, we are pregnant. <laughs> so, now the language they use is that it is. So I uh, hear the issue. I said, this is strange usage. It's men don't get pregnant. It's good. No, no, we're as a family are getting pregnant. So he showed me a book which was, you know, which was about what a man should do when, when he's pregnant. The man cannot be pregnant. Even then, if his wife is pregnant, he's pregnant. It's strange usage. 
But anyway, the point is that the, at least, whether it is the mother or the father, the parent needs to be more mature than the child. Now, if the child has to give some, child has to do certain things which are, which are mistress. Say the child has to take some, has to take some injection. Now, convincing the child that the injection is good is quite difficult. Convincing the parent that the injection is good is relatively easier. Isn't it? Unless the parents are also in children. Then it will be a problem. <laughs> so, you know, it's easy to become a parent biologically. But in terms of psychology, in terms of responsibility, it's not that easy. So, but it's easier to convince the parent than to convince the child. Similarly, it's easier to strengthen the intelligence than to weaken the mind. The mind will also become weakened, but that I won't discuss much. Now, how do we strengthen the intelligence? It is by primarily study. It is when we study wisdom texts, we learn from the experience of others. We don't have to go through each vector in this world to know that there's poison in it. Others are alive at the end of the fun of poison. So many vectors we have gone through in the past and now there's poison, 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 poison. poison. We can learn from the experience of the past. Now, of course, Avita is not just a book of the past. The book that has spoken in the past and it speaks and speaks. But it is study. It is intelligence. Our intelligence is primary nourished by study. We want to exercise. Why should we exercise? We need something about the benefits of exercise. And that inspires to exercise. We want to meditate. Why should I meditate? We need something about the benefits of meditation. In study. That's what we first step. But study alone is not enough. After that, there is reflection. Reflection means that the intelligence should not, that the parent should not just hear the doctor. Yeah, the doctor says, you know, please come and give the child this particular injection and give this medicine. Yeah, okay. Yes. The child says, the parent says yes, and the parent forgets it afterwards. Parent neglects it Parent needs to think, oh, this is important. Reflection. So that's why Shravan after this manan. Hmm? That Shravan is hearing manan. It is interesting. Man, manan, it doesn't involve the mana, it involves the Buddha more. Because <laughs> the man will not allow any manan. <laughs> <laughs> the man will be so sensual, the man will be so wandering. That manan, contemplation, reflection, is very difficult. Hmm? So it is reflection that is more, that is very important. Okay. Yeah, I heard that. That was a very good point. But am I convinced about it? And somebody else is speaking it. They are speaking in a very persuasive way. And say, yeah, I can't find any arguments to refute this. So then they are told that worldly pleasures end in distress. One part of us secretly hopes it is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so much. So I must be enjoying in this world. So many people enjoy. Yeah, there is enjoyment. Nobody is denying that. But the problem is how much enjoyment and how much consequence after that. That is something we consider. So reflect. That is one. And then after that, there is realization. Realization is where the mind starts getting converted. Realization means that we ourselves experience it. Reflection means, okay, I hear it, and that time it makes sense. Then I think about it myself afterwards. Yeah, it still makes sense. And then I look back at my life, or I go through something in my life, and I see, yeah, really, this is true. But then that is the time when we become taken. At this point, what happens is, the mind also comes on board. The mind also joins. Realization means that we experience something. Then the mind comes on board. The mind says, yeah, this is good. So the process of converting the mind will take time. But what we can do is the pragya, which is to study our wisdom by study, by reflection, and by seeking realization. Realization is a whole big subject, but I'll quickly explain that definition is. Realization means what is a reality we accept it to be a reality.
So what is a reality that we accept it is a reality. So for example, wealth does not bring happiness. So people say, yeah, most people like agree to that. And they secretly say that. Wealth does not bring happiness. Yeah, for me it will bring happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the idea. But suppose we meet some very super wealthy person and and that person was was their car. They talk, start talking with us. They are living in a mansion with a fleet of cars. And then that person starts talking and starts talking. And then mm-hmm. actually, my wife died of cancer. My daughter got married to someone, and she left, and she finally gets my will. And she's not even talking down with me. My son is a dramatic, and all my relatives are simply waiting for me to die. Mm-hmm. Where there is a will. Where there is a will, there are many willing relatives. A willing relative is just to show affection, show kindness, show giving. Forget me. So I don't even know who I can trust, who actually loves me, who actually cares for me. So this actually happened to me once in my early days of Krishna consciousness. So. Uh, and it actually really uh, struck me. This person is wealthy, but this is not happening at all. It's a huge mansion. But all that mansion is doing is providing a huge amount of space in which to be unhappy. So, so that which is a realization, we experience that which is a reality, we experience it with. That's when we get realization. Now we all we have some realization that have any mystical. So we all experience at times. Okay, sometimes I just don't feel like waking up in the morning. We will wake up, take a bath, start doing some meditation. Then in the night, start chanting, start. Uh, I afterwards feel so much better. My day goes smoothly. I feel energized. So yeah, initially it was a poison, but then it didn't come after it. So let me push on. Next day when the poison come, let me push on the it comes. So coming back to what. Going back to this diagram to conclude this point, there is initial poison and then there is eventual nectar. So what study does is it tells us this nectar exists. Without philosophical study, without studying wisdom text, we won't even know that nectar exists. We know this poison. Why are people doing this? Now, why would anyone do this? So study helps us understand nectar exists. Then after that, reflection, mm. or rather you could say that mm. when study is, in, it informs, it's at the information level. It informs us that this exists. Then when there's reflection, there is more of conviction that it exists. But this literally exists. The doctors of theory it exists. And when you talk about realization, there is experience that it exists. So when you go to these three levels, at this level, third level of realization, then see the pragyama. So pragyama begins with here. At this level, we have pragyama. We study to get the pragyama. But when we get realization, the pragyama becomes tita. Tita means study. Then situated. So this is how Krishna says, we all can persist in the things that will bring us real happiness. And they will ultimately become situated in steady habits. Even when the external world will be having ups and downs, because we will be pursuing the higher purpose. We will be moving beyond the initial poison to the nectar. We will be rejoicing in that nectar. Nectar of living for a higher purpose, nectar of experiencing a higher reality and thereby becoming, if not transcendental, at least more tolerant to life's ups and downs. So I summarize what I spoke today, what I spoke broadly, three points. First point was that happiness is both a state of being and state of mind. That State of being is at the physical level, mind is at the mental level. So externals can be good or bad, 
But the mind can make a small bad very quick and a small good also very quick. Small enjoyable thing you can make in the system. So that is the first part about it. The second part we discussed is about the nature of pleasure and how the electron the beginning, the poison in the end, the poison the beginning, the electron in the end, and how the mind looks at the initial things. It has the intelligence looks at the eventual things. So we often we forget the tug of war. We take the tug of war in the externals. I will give up this and I will take up this. But Krishna says the real tug. If you want to win that tug of war, it is not at the external level that I will give up this object and do this thing, do this thing. <laughs> but rather internal level. The tug of war and intelligence of the mind we need to win back by making the intelligence stronger than the mind. And the last part was. Changing, weakening the mind or changing the mind is, is far tough, more, far more difficult. Just like persuading a child the injection is good, is actually, uh, yes. if you consider intelligence versus the mind, strengthening this is easier, weakening this is tougher. So convincing the child is not that easy. So what we do is convince the parent. And how do we do that? We strengthen the intelligence by studying. That is Shravan. Then, then, then there is reflection. And then there is realization. Completely absorbed. So we, by the study, we are informed that after this poison, the nectar is there. By reflection, we convince ourselves that it is there. And through, through realization, we ask the experience that it is there. And once we start experiencing that, the mind also starts saying, hey, yeah, I took the child, I took the injection, it felt initially bad, but now I'm feeling so much. And I'm changing. I can admit I can do so many things. Yeah, this, I can take the injection. The mind will also become convinced. And that's the time when our inner tug of war will subside considerably. And we'll be situated in steady higher purpose and higher meaning. Thank you very much. Hare Hare there's a very grave class on happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so happiness can be a very serious business. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions from anyone who has not asked questions till now? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, in the big in the middle of the session, you told that intelligence is reflective and generally mind is impulsive. But then, uh, so my question is, does mind, can mind also reflect, can mind also reflect on the question? Because in the beginning of the session, you also told that mind can exaggerate the problem. So that is when we think of the problem and reflect upon it. And that becomes very distressful, more distressful. Okay, good question. So, the question is that I said the Italy is reflective, but can the mind also not reflect? So, well, certain words have certain meanings. So, let's say if you say something to somebody, you're, you're swimming, and as a, as a positive motivation, you have to think. You know, I think a bone that's showing up or something, you know, not. So, thing has a slightly negative knowledge. Hmm? So, like that, reflection generally has a connotation which is positive. And reflection is more conscious. You know, isn't that? It's conscious and it's intentional. So, change the color? Yes. yes. Oh, you should have told me earlier. Don't be so humble. But change your skin. So reflection is better. The positive connotation. It indicates it's when you're reflecting, it's conscious, it's intentional. We we know we are doing it and we want to do it. But generally the mind does something. It's not so much a reflection as there can be different emotions, but it's more like a lamentation. It's more of 
it can be in the more common word is whining. You heard the word whining? No. Stop whining. That means complaining. It's like, it's like a very weak, weak. You know? So here the mind is just really, it's just, it's like a auto replay of the past. Auto replay of the past or not everything. Oh, this is so good, this is so good, that is so terrible, that is so terrible, that is so terrible, that is so terrible. So it's almost something is going on its own. And something, some, some bad thing has happened to us in the past. And they remember it. I was in Washington and this one devotee there. I told him, I met him all I told him all I told him, I met that devotee. And he said, they were friends. He said, they were close friends. He said, not close friends. He was a little annoyed. What close friends? He said, what? He says, they're close friends. He took $25 from me 25 years ago. He's not a dumb <laughs> <laughs> I had in all your friendship 25 years ago, all that you knew is 25 dollars. Yeah, maybe it was bad that you didn't return. I said, nothing else you can But the mind can make small things, just keeps replaying them again and again. So, is that a reflection? No, it's subconscious. Hmm? And it is generally unintentional. That's why it's more like. Sometimes we call it self talk, what is just going on in the mind. This is what the mind does is not reflection. Another word for it is mental chatter. This is mental chatter, chatter, chatter. Some people just they have the chatter boxes. This can't stop talking. There's, a, there's one, I was with one person, and we had three of us together. So the third person was constantly talking. The second person told me, doesn't he have a mood button? <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately our mind is like that, it's a box. So the, we, there's no mood button for the mind also. But then the best way to silence the chakra box is to not listen to them. Um, if you're just doing something else, you're talking on our phone, you're reading something, the chakra box will say we are not going to listen to the subject. These are the chakra box. Because they want attention. But if they don't get it, they'll silence. So the, what the mind does is chapter, it's not like that. Okay. Yes, please. Spreading like a... Spreading like a mix, it will end up study, but reflection it is very difficult. Mind is will not allow me. For me, at least to reflect. So it will go in another direction. Now can I increase my reflection? Yeah. When the mind doesn't allow us to reflect, what do we do? That's why we preach to others. <laughs> <laughs> it is not that we preach because we are practicing, because it is because preaching itself forces us to practice. <laughs> the Prabhupada presented sharing about wisdom as a part of our sadhana. It's not that we have to come sit there and then we share it. At least if I have to speak this point to someone else, then I have to reflect on it. How will I convince the other person about this point? What are the likely objections that they will have? What the questions they will raise? How can I address those questions? So if we get a class, we like a point in the class, we we'll try to share with someone. And not just repeat the point. Repeat the point and we'll add something about what you like about the point. Generally, one simple way to make wisdom our own. Our own means that, that wisdom becomes a part of us. Is put it in our own words. Put it in your own words. Any point you hear? Some, some. That doesn't mean we have to rephrase all Sanskrit shlokas. <laughs> Sometimes some 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 even some in some classes when they have some points like quotable points. That's fine. But put it in your own words. Okay, what did you like about that quote? So much. You like a particular verse. What do you like about that verse? So put that in your own words. The simple. This is articulation. Articulation means putting in our words. Articulation is a simple way to do reflection. 
Just put it in your own words. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. How the mind and intelligence perform before getting addicted and after getting it? Means what after getting addiction on anything? What feels? What feels that it is a poison and what makes us to act more and more times again? Okay. So if we are addicted to something, first of all, addiction is a very uh, specific thing. It's not addiction. Sometimes our is in general sense, you know, I'm addicted to my phone. But it's it sort of cheapens the gravity of the world. Addiction is a very serious thing because I'm attached. Hmm. Uh, so I mean, so, so when we are attached to something, at that time, basically certain you could say. There's a battle between the mind versus <coughs> mind versus the intelligence. So what happens is if we keep choosing the mind, we keep doing what the mind is saying, then the mind tends to become bigger and the intelligence becomes smaller. Then eventually, after some time, the mind has become giant and the intelligence has become really, really tiny. And after that, the mind is here and the intelligence is there. There's no versus at all. That means we don't even resist for here. That means we start thinking that what the mind is saying is not only right, there's nothing to oppose it. Let's do it in a way that we can get away with it. The intelligence covers up the track. The intelligence is used to rationalize. <coughs> I saw once a cartoon, a person was saying that no, you have to, uh, cop was cop pulled over a uh, pulled over a uh, person who was driving very fast. The cop said, You are driving too fast. And the person inside the head is saying, It was not fast enough. That's how you caught me. So if I only got fast enough, you would not have caught me. It will be okay. Well, it's not okay. Spirit will kill. So the point is that one, when somebody addicted, when the intelligence is not a force. Intelligence becomes a accomplice. Or it will become like a servant of the mind. Mm -hmm. That is a very dangerous state to be in. So somehow or other, the intelligence has to be awakened. And then intelligence will not only be awakened, but also has to be strengthened. That's when it gradually so grow. It happens. It's a, it is a gradual process. I don't have to discourage if it's taking time. I talk in future sessions about this more. But we think you know, sometimes we will struggle and fail, we struggle and succeed. Then eventually, basically, in the future sessions of this, I talk about this, there is failure without struggle. Hmm? This is where the mind and the intelligence are on the same side. Then there is failure with struggle. Here okay, what is happening? The mind is stronger than the intelligence. Then there is success with struggle. This is where the intelligence becomes stronger than the mind. And then finally there will be success without struggle. Then what will happen is the intelligence and the mind have come on the same side, the good side. So we'll all go through these stages. For all of us, depending on our past, upbringing and things like that, there will be some things in which we naturally over here. So some of us, if we had come from good culture families, somebody tells us to take the drugs, forget it. I don't even have to, there's no inner temptation of, no, I'm not doing it. Some people are doing the same thing for me, not me. some people are something else. No. So we are all at this level in some things. Now, of course, this is not a reversible statement. We keep associating with people who are doing those things. You can, what was a complete no can also become uh, maybe a yes, can become like that. So, but we all can go in this direction. So it's an incremental process and never lose hope. And do this and just keep sending it. Gradually, it will become strong enough. Any other questions?
Uh, just said uh, you are mentioning that uh, uh, at any situation, how we know whether our mind is that we are doing is coming from our mind or intelligence. And you don't like how to train intelligence is by study, reflection, and all. But if you study only wrong things, then the reflection and everything goes wrong. Is there any shastric definition of what exactly is mind? What exactly is intelligence? When this mind is acting? When this intelligence is acting? Like such yes. a person. Well, in the scriptural letters, how do we know which is the mind which is the intelligence? Well, the third kind of Shri Bhagavata in the fundamental principles of the material nature, the teachings of Kapila De, Lord Kapila, there is some description of the function of the mind, function of the intelligence. So, but it's quite analytical. Broadly speaking, it's not possible to know when the mind is speaking and the intelligence is speaking. Because our inner world doesn't come with convenient labels. <laughs> if somebody is, if suppose I mean, we bought 25 items from Amazon and all of those items came in boxes completely unlabeled. Mm -hmm. So you have to open each box to see what is there. So like that, from where the voices come from within, which voice is coming from there is almost impossible to do. But what we can try to know is not where a voice comes from, but where the voice will take. That means from inside us, there are many different voices can come. So let's put it a spectrum. They consider the inner voices that come in. There are some which we know they will have negative consequences. There are some which we know will have positive results. So if we just begin with this. And if we start saying yes to the positive and no to the, no to the negative, gradually this area will also start gaining more clarity. So the idea is don't worry about what is not clear. Work on what is clear. I do we say for example, I don't know that if I spend six hours watching TV and I have an exam coming in a few days. That's only going to make me feel angry with myself, feel bitter, feel bad. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to be tempted, but I'm going to say no. So, we'll start with what we know. But if we say, I know what is bad, but I can't do it, then yeah, that's true. But it's not that everything that we know is bad, we can't do it. There are some things which we can reduce, something which we can do also with a little effort. So, where there is clarity, begin with that. And gradually, and what by the clarity means, I know if I do this, this will be good for me. I know this is going to be bad. So focus on two things, focus on not the source, but on the destination. Then focus on what is clear and not on what is unclear. But sometimes the intelligence can add uh, like very foolishly. It's like people who are thinking to create very intelligent like bombs, like can we say that their intelligence is acting properly? Like their intelligence is only guiding them, not mine. So, when people act foolishly, is it their intelligence guiding them or their mind? Well, it depends. In real life, the intelligence and mind are not so black and white different. It's subtle. So, if somebody is making bombs, well, why are they making the bombs? This is going to kill people. Well, maybe possible, but then if you see in India, India, Pakistan, China, before 1980, we have had several wars. But after the 1980s, all three countries have got nuclear weapons. And nobody that attacked any others, except for one or two occasions, some small incursions, but no major sustained war that they can use. Why? Because deterrence. Deterrence means that you know, the other party has people to use destroyers. So are those who are making bombs, are they bad? Are bombs bad? And in principle, yes. They create a company destroy so many people. Millions of people. But in practice, real life is messy. If somebody else has a bomb, or somebody else may get the bomb earlier. There are strong rumors that, that uh, Hitler was developing nuclear weapons. 
Uh, and that's why I signed out a letter to his world saying that you have to do this. That's how the Manhattan Project came. And then eventually, when the war was won, towards the end of the war, when bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at that time, Einstein regretted his letter. He said that, now, apparently, it did not get the German was not as close as it was thought, because they had a lot of uh, uranium, but the processing of uranium did not have the facility. So he said that it was my instruct, my letter, he said of the process that led to the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He regretted that. It was like when he was being guided only by the, by the mind and other teams. Then that's, that's a little superficial, a little, a little unfair analysis. So my understanding is that we have to look at situations a little more carefully. But there are times when some people's intelligence is completely controlled by their mind. And then, yes, is there intelligence speaking? The intelligence is speaking, but it's speaking not to oppose the mind, but to simply uh, expand or implement in a better way what the mind is saying. That is a dangerous thing. The oh, is good? No, certainly not. Intelligence, which depends on what it is used for in the Bhagavad Gita in the 18th chapter, Krishna talks about buddhi, sattvamana, buddhi, rajyamana, buddhi, tamamana. Goodness, passion, ignorance. So, intelligence and ignorance is what it is. Sarvartham viparitam shu. Adharmam dharma vidya manyate tamasavartham. Sarvartham viparitam shu. Buddhi sa paartatam asi. That which is wrong. One continues to be right. In this way, everywhere one gets the opposite of real influence. Buddhi sa paartha tam si. It is intense more than You know, in the West especially, uh, abortion is a very big issue now. And uh, Prabhupada who say that a man and a woman, they are unregulated in their meeting. The woman ends up pregnant. And she has to be at the, she has to be the primary caregiver of the child. Therefore, there has to be definition made in the But the Western reasoning is that actually nature has been terribly unfair to women. Both men and women have sex, but women only get pregnant. So, abortion is the technological cure for nature's unfairness. Is it unfair? Well, it's a, it's a gift, it's a privilege to be a real child, to carry on humanity. It's, it's a privilege. It's, only, it's a superpower that only women have. But unfortunately, that is being seen as a burden. So, in traditional societies, if a woman is not able to hear a child, then it's, it's, a, it's a sad situation. It's, it's a childless. In the West, it's not childless. Don't call me childless. I'm child free. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, I'm not blaming women. It's just that the whole culture is such a way that that's how they start thinking. They're thinking that I have to achieve, I have to build a career, I have to have a big life. And abortion is a big business. The company, many of these big companies, this is huge, Fortune 500 companies, they often pay women to do abortion. Why? Because if a woman has a child, that means the company will have to lose four, five, six months of paid pregnancy leave. The company wanted to lose. They say, if you are going to have children, also you have like egg banks. You take out your eggs right now, you store them, and then you are situating a career at 45, 50, they peacefully have children in it. If your body can't have children, you can fertilize your eggs at that. You can fertilize them with whoever's semen you want. So here it's it's all so here what's happening a whole amount of intelligence and rationalization is used. It's all for a destructive purpose. It's all for the purpose of destroying what is a privilege for women and what is a necessity for humanity. Procreation. Any other questions? Uh, like nowadays, like whenever we are trying to get somebody as no, like then they are able to see only the immediate pleasure and they are not able to see the nectar as a poison or 
and uh, that time it is very difficult for convincing them. And also one more thing is that they will say that I'll take it only little as long as the nectar is there, I'll take it and then what is the problem? And uh, by restraining from it, I'm actually losing the nectar that I'm with. So how do we guide such a person stating? Yeah, good question. So if somebody doesn't see the, see the poison and somebody is like, you take the nectar, what do we do for them? Well, that's why we need to focus more on Tugra Karma. <laughs> we call it as minor Tugra Karma. <laughs> we use yellow. So we focus on higher purpose. Not so much on lower pleasure. Dad, there is poison at the end of the day, therefore don't do it. People <laughs> say, okay, but the nectar makes it worth it. Today <laughs> morning I have a terrible hangover. But yesterday was a great party. <laughs> so today's hangover is worth it. <laughs> so see what happens is this nectar poison calculation that is very subjective. <laughs> For somebody else, why do you you have a hangover? It's not. It's fun. It's worth it. So generally, the ne- focusing on the negative it is not really effective. What we want to focus on is that actually persisting towards the higher purpose. That can make our life more meaningful. It can make our life more fulfilling. And a lot of people are open to that. A lot of people, they, they, they want a sense of meaning and purpose to their life. And anything meaningful, anything purposeful, that requires sacrifice. That requires giving up what is immediately needed for us. So, even if somebody does something, something not necessarily spiritual, but benefit. I mean, if somebody wants to do some charity work, some volunteer work, they want to protect the environment, and they want to help feed some other people. Now, that person, if they want to do those things, maybe that person could be comfortable sitting on the couch and watching TV or playing video games, but they give it and go somewhere else. do something. So, sacrifice is required. So, we, we focus on when we are sharing spirituality. We focus on how spirituality can bring higher meaning and purpose to our that, that nectar, is, uh, I'm going to speak this in later class, in the fourth class, that nectar in the end, it is not just the spiritual world where there be eternal happiness. It's actually a more meaningful life here. In this world. So when we mold our life according to certain principles, we try to follow those principles properly, then our life becomes more meaningful. Even from an ordinary perspective, a student who just uh, say for the student is studying uh, medicine and they scrape through and they just get some degree and they're pretty patients, but most of the time they treat and they're not ready with the patients, but somehow. They, uh, because of their degree, they keep making money. Now, that doctor does not get as much fulfillment as someone who's actually learned the subject and is actually treating and healing. Mm-hmm. Somebody, some engineer who just doesn't scrapes through and then builds the building just, it just crashes up or something. And then and it crashes, they use their engineer at that time to come up with some creative excuse why it crashed. Mm-hmm. Well, better use engineers before and, and then you build something wonderful. Make a, make a good functional device, make a nice product that helps people. It's at a material level, we may say that, but it's helpful, there's a fulfillment about it. So we need to focus more on the higher purpose, not on the lower pleasure and its consequences. That just doesn't work in today's world. Because the poison in the air, it is, uh, it is, it's evaluation subjective. The poison is not subjective, but how, how toxic the poison is. That is a subjective evaluation. Also, in continuation to the same, like somebody may say that I do it not regularly, I do it very 
Infrequently, that's all. What is the problem with it? I know infrequently, what is the problem with it? Yes. That's, that's the Christian statement. You drink but don't get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will be surprised how much you're drinking is a part of not just Western culture, but Christian culture. There is a there is a Christian thinker who said that the taste of wine is the proof that God loves us. <laughs> <laughs> If God didn't exist in the house, how would something so delicious exist? So yeah, in certain cultures, certain things are very common. And can people drink without becoming drunk? Well, yes, it's possible. But the problem is that initially somebody may drink just because they're a social drinker. <laughs> Something the boys activity stuff like So, so somebody may basically somebody may call what we call a social drinker. And I drink just to hang out with, with my friends. When we have party, when we, I don't I don't get drunk. But yes, it may be possible that somebody may do that. But as one keeps drinking, that is also creating impressions in the mind. That will become one's go-to mechanism, the coping mechanism that one feels done. And eventually, one will one feels stressed, one feels uh, lonely, one will feel uh, misunderstood or whatever. And then they will drink. That's the time they will So it's a, it's a matter of recognizing that there is risk over. Now, just that does risk always mean that there's not a disaster? No. But is the risk necessary to take? Well, no. So I think in this in this kind of argument, there is no willing if you don't if that person is not open-minded. So best not focus on that. Because if we just come up as being fanatic, so if you try to argue that everybody who drinks occasionally will eventually end up a compulsive drinker, it doesn't happen like that. But can it happen? Well, it can definitely happen. And it's a, it's a significantly higher probability than somebody who is not drinking at all. So, but that is not an argument we should focus on. Uh, a lot of, uh, lot of expertise or intelligence when we are trying to share special wisdom is to know which battles to fight and which battles to avoid. Mm -hmm. So, choose your battles. So, if somebody is too lazy at drinking occasionally or in some way occasionally, then, then maybe they're not affecting them too much right now. And we try to tell them this affects you a lot. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's like a doctor prescribing an expensive medicine for a disease that the patient thinks I don't have. You know, I don't even have this disease. You know, I'm not going to take this medicine, but I have to pay this much for this. Forget it. So that is basically people say there's people's people say that actual need and then there is their felt need uh, felt need you know, what they feel is their need so if you focus only on their actual need and you are not addressing any of their felt needs then you have no no connection so we need to find out where they intersect this is actually need this is the felt need so this is the this can be the area of focus and this might sometimes mean that you allow him what he is doing and make him realize or something like that. Or you don't allow him what he is Like the same type of what he is doing Yeah, I mean, who are we to allow anyone? <laughs> Everybody has their free will. Of course, if we are parents, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have siblings and we are responsible for them. But ultimately, everything has free will. We, yeah, what we do is that. There is always a trade off between getting the other person to do the right thing and maintaining the relationship with the other person. Sometimes you just maintain the relationship even if they are doing the wrong thing. And they themselves will eventually realize the consequence of the wrong thing. And if you maintain the relationship, then they will connect with us and they will be more receptive to our help at that time. But if somebody says, this is quite often parenting, parents say, 
if you you are doing the terrible thing, you are making a big mistake, and one day you will realize it. When you realize it, you will come crawling back to me. Now the child may realize the mistake, but because the parent made it an ego issue, the child will never come back. So maintaining the relationship is something very important. That's what Sri Prabhupada did. Many times when his disciples will make mistakes, have some moral lapses, we focus more on maintaining the relationship rather than simply mandating or <coughs> chastising them for doing their own wrong thing. Okay, the last question, Mr. Strong. This is one question. When, uh, when Dalaman says that uh, when you want to get happiness, stop looking for it, as much as distress comes up with one God. So, is he talking about the bodily level of happiness and distress? When Pranamana is talking about that, so, so come and get from the Ikyam, 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 the So he said, just as happiness, the distress comes up its own accord, happiness will also come up its own accord. Why strive for it? See, what he's saying over there is the key words often all over this, Deha Yogi, no. Deha Yogi means by connection with the body. With every body, a certain kind of happiness is already yours. So, uh, say birds or animals can eat certain kinds of foods. We can't eat those kinds of foods. Mm -hmm. So among the kind of food that we eat, some are tasty, some are not tasty. So there is a certain limit, because it's a certain bond, certain scope, and certain sources of happiness, which are associated with each body, and we can't change that. That is fixed. But within that scope, so for example, we generally can't eat wood. We, we can't eat stones. But among the foods that we eat, can we cook them well and make them tasty, or can we just cook them poorly and make them uh, make them taste, make them not taste your tasteless? We can. So what he's talking about is that there are certain boundaries to our happiness, but within the boundaries, we can go up or we can go down. So it is if if everything were distant, then why would we have say Ayurveda? This is the whole branch of which Ayurveda is what? It is essentially meant to improve our health. It is not to improve our health. Ayurveda, what it means is the, the knowledge for Ayu for increasing one's lifespan. If our lifespan is, is fixed. Is this time now that our lifespan increased? And what it means is that no one statement can be completely absolutized. Yes, there are certain kinds of happiness which we are never going to get, no matter how much we endeavor. But does it mean that I say, if I am sick and I don't take medicine, will that mean my distress won't increase? And because the situations I face are not just a result of my past. They are a complex combination of my past and present time. Suppose somebody eats a dozen ice creams on a cold night and they enjoy that. The next morning they wake up and their throat is terrible. Now was that because of the past karma? Yeah, past night's karma. <laughs> <laughs> not past life stuff, isn't it? So certainly the whole idea of functioning Satvogona, not functioning Rajasana, Samogona, why is that important? Because Krishna says Rajasas to follow him to come. When you act in Rajogona, it leads to distress. When you act in Tamogona, it leads to even greater distress. So, yes, it's like, uh, okay, another example to illustrate this, I can go with this is that. Right? So whole big subject and what I answer may also raise many more questions. But it's basically like Deha Yogi is a very key word. 
It's like each one of us has been given a car. The body is like a car. So it's going on. So each car will drive at its own speed, at its own comfort level. Uh, I'm so comfortable, I have so much of it. That we can't change. So they are your cleaner, by the kind of body we have, certain limits are free. But somebody can drive a car recklessly, and maybe the car could have lasted for 10 years and lasts for 10 days, and it's in a it's in a crash and destroy. Somebody can drive a man, do no maintenance of the car. And the car consumes more fuel in one year than what it will require to buy a new car. Isn't it? So, how we act with what we have does have its consequences. So, our present actions, the way we do with our body, can they increase our happiness? Well, not in the sense that a sedan is never going to go like a sports car. Mm -hmm. A car is never going to go at the speed of air. So, there is certain limits imposed by the body on us. But within those limits, so the, when he says pleasure, happiness will come automatically as stress comes, what he means is a certain amount of pleasure. So, if, if a car doesn't go very fast, yeah, that, that limitation is there, that annoyance is there. But then, if a car is not going fast and we're going to natural territory, we can have, look at the beautiful scenery. We can get certain advantages to it. Nothing in the world is a mixed, is complete curse or complete blessing. So that, in that sense, is fixed. But what we do in this time does matter. And not just about the future like consequences. Then this time this get the consequences also. What he's saying in that verse, another thing is, okay, so this one on and all. This is an important point. That don't over-endeavor in what happens. Don't endeavor so much for happiness that you forget your time. You forget what is really important in life. So the focus is on doing your dharma. Right? And sometimes while doing our dharma, some people may get more pleasure, some people may get less pleasure. Don't worry about it. If we do our service, and a few people recognize our service. Somebody else does some service, and a hundred people recognize their service. <coughs> they say, why is this difference? Should I just give up my service and start doing their service? No, this is what my service is. This is what my nature is. <coughs> For some of us, there's greater happiness in terms of the material recognition, the material remuneration. Those things may, may, may be fixed. You're not going to change them entirely. But don't give up your time. That is the key point of this. Let's talk more about this because it's a whole subject. We'll, we'll discuss more again in the future. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki. Srimad Prabhupada Ki. Gaurabhaktavrinda ki. Gaurabhaktavrinda ki. Gaurabhaktavrinda ki.